Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start. Good morning. So this is the ninth festival of art history in Fontainebleau, presented by the INHA and the Chateau de Fontainebleau. And so t now we're going to have a presentation on myth and magic in Finnish art in the 1900s. And we have Dr. Maya Lahelma from the University of Helsinki. If you have a question, we can take questions at the end. You have headsets at the back of the room if you don't uh, understand English. Thank you very much, and I hope you'll enjoy this. Okay, um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Finnish art around the year 1900. I do realize now that probably my, uh, the title of my talk was slightly mistranslated into French because uh, I'm talking about the art around the year 1900, so the end of the 19th century and the very beginning of the 20th century. And this talk... Uh, examines the popularity of themes relating to myth and magic among Finnish artists of this period. Um, and I'm approaching this as a reflection of the new subjective and imaginative approach to art. Of course, the revival of myth and magic among artists was not as such specific to Finland but it was part of an international current of subjectivity and uh, reaction against positivism and naturalism. Also, a feeling of cultural decline and decadence had emerged in Central Europe, and the resuscitation of mythical traditions appeared as a counterforce to this decadent sensibility. From the Romantic tradition emerged the idea that folk legends and poems uh, contained a memory of the lost unity of mankind. Uh, so elements from different cultures could therefore be combined and claimed as the property of all humanity. Uh, Theosophists and other modern occultists, moreover, believe that all kinds of ancient myths were carriers of esoteric teachings, and that all religions and myths, uh, of, ancient, uh, uh, myths of origin contain the same fundamental truth in the core of their doctrines. Uh, they also held that recent scientific discoveries, like electricity, hypnotism, or the theory of evolution were nothing but new formulations of knowledge that had previously been part of the secret doctrine and available only for initiates. So it was believed that art was able to uh, convey the secret uh, content of myths with its symbolic language and it could therefore express truths that modern science was only beginning to decipher. So art was just understood as a form of knowledge and a source of truth. And uh, it could therefore also uh, even take the place of religion. Uh, as most of you probably know, in France, uh, Brittany became a kind of a cult place for artists, uh, partly, for example, due to its, its uh, old Celtic language and old customs that had survived into the modern day. In Finland, it was particularly the eastern province of Karelia that came to be seen as a region where ancient customs and traditions still survived. Uh, and more importantly, even it was uh, believed to be the kind of mythical wonderland where the heroes of the national epic, the Kalevala, once had roamed. But as we, we shall, shall see it during this talk, uh, Christian traditions and classical mytho mythology were also very important. Uh, like their contemporaries all over Europe, Finnish artists were inspired by uh, things like occultism and spiritualism, as well as folklore, fairy tales, and vernacular traditions. Uh, this newly found subjective and spiritual attitude 
did not only affect the content of art, the subject matter of art, but it also had a significant impact on its uh, expressive and formal qualities. Uh, many of these artists uh, studied in, in Paris in the 1880s and 1890s. Okay. 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 So I've been asked to to repeat uh, some of what I um, earlier. Uh, so um, as I said, in, uh, in whereas in France, Brittany became a cult place for artists. Uh, in Finland, it was uh, uh, the eastern province of, of Karelia, uh, which was uh, kind of believed to be the mythical place uh, where uh, the heroes of the, of the national epic, the Kalevala, had, had uh, once roamed. Uh, but also Christian traditions and, and classical mythology were important. Uh, and then, like their contemporaries all over Europe, Finnish artists were inspired by things like occultism and spiritualism, as well as folklore, fairy tales, and vernacular traditions. And uh, many of these artists, they uh, studied in Paris uh, in the 1880s and 1890s. And um, this generation of Finnish artists uh, familiarized themselves with uh, symbolist art and theory uh, with its inclination towards the imaginary, intuitive and spiritual. Uh, symbolist art was concerned with modern interpretations of myths, legends and folk stories uh, from the classical and, and Christian traditions to all kinds of national mythologies. Uh, also, a new kind of admiration for all things northern arose, uh, partly as a result of the idea that European culture was degenerating. So it was believed that, uh, that a northern influence had the potential to invigorate decadent Central European culture. And uh, this was a state of affairs that proved to be quite beneficial for artists who came from uh, northern Europe. Uh, Finnish artists were very quick to respond to the ne new impulses that they encountered on their travels to Paris, as well as other artistic centers of Europe. Um, symbolism, of course, uh, in visual art has traditionally been considered uh, mainly a French phenomenon, uh, following its uh, literary predecessor, uh, which, of course, first emerged in the avant-garde circles of, pa of Paris. Uh, but when the aesthetic theories of symbolism were translated into the language of uh, visual art, the geographical focus of the movement kind of started to shift uh, from the center towards the peripheries, including Finland and the other Nordic countries. And in fact, in France, the whole uh, symbolist phenomenon was often perceived as, as Germanic uh, because it had these uh, Wagnerian themes and also the philosophical basis uh, for a large part derived from German Romanticism. And this uh, philosophical tradition uh, of like German uh, idealism was the dominant philosophical current in all Nordic countries throughout the 19th century 
So uh, therefore, for the Finnish artists who came into contact with its new formulations in the symbolist context, it already contained elements that they were familiar with. Um, and this romantic foundation also made it possible for the artists to combine elements of nationalism and modernism. Uh, in the eyes of Central European audiences, Nordic art, in fact, kind of seemed to naturally possess the qualities that were es essential to modern art. It was subjective, simple in form, but also able to carry complex meanings. Um, and it was connected to an artistic tradition that was completely different from the dominant academic model. So, in short, Nordic art manifested the ideal combination of modernity and primitiveness that was sought by forward-looking artists all over Europe. Um, the admira admiration for Wagner, for example, had introduced Central European audiences to Nordic mythologies, and uh, soon almost anything that came from the northern part of Europe could be seen in terms of of this kind of mythical conception of the North. And this notion of idealized northernness had a great impact on the self-understanding of artists who came from the northern outskirts, outskirts of Europe. It stimulated their imagination and, and kind of encouraged them to explore national traditions and to develop a, a kind of mystical sense of nature. It could even awaken in them a belief that their artistic activities were part of a sacred mission connected to the fate of the whole mankind. Uh, from the theosophical doctrine of different world periods, they could find support to the idea that it was now time for Scandinavia to assume the leadership of humanity's intellectual advance. Hence, uh, the northern background gave these artists and their works a certain outsider quality that they could integrate as part of their artistic identities. Uh, in the European environment that valued all things um, that were considered primitive and exotic, it was possible to turn uh, the kind of stereotypical role that was enforced on them into an advantage. Uh, this feeling of of a kind of Nordic superiority was expressed very clearly by the artist uh, Pekka Halonen, who wrote the following statement uh, on the poor quality of the Paris salons uh, of 1892 to his friend and fellow artist uh, Eero Jarnefeld. And you can see that he was not overly impressed. There is no point for us Nordics to send anything here. We are too good for that. You would not believe how badly the Frenchmen are starting to paint. They are going backwards with the rumble. They are so tired already that one feels sleepy just looking at their paintings. <laughs> so uh, the new artistic directions that emerged towards the end of the 19th century were deeply involved in the most uh, acute philosophical concerns of the day. Uh, the disintegrating forces of modernity appeared to have separated man from the world, and it seemed that art would offer the best available means for, for kind of bridging the gap. Uh, artists therefore didn't, did not hesitate to tackle the most fundamental issues uh, of humanity, such as uh, the question of mortality uh, and the fragility of our individual existence. Uh, Death was an overall popular subject in, uh, in the international current of, of symbolist art. Um, it provided those with decadent sensibilities with suitably horrifying subject matter, but it could also lead artists towards uh, uh, philosophical speculations. Uh, Hugo Simberi uh, was the artist, uh, the Finnish artist, who produced the most original imagery of death. Uh, even though he clearly drew from medieval imagery, his figure of death is, is also individualized and therefore uh, very modern. It picks its victims one by one, reminding us that even if death is universal, at the face of it, we are all alone. Uh, in, 
Simberg's art that does not appear as a mystery, but as something completely familiar. Uh, and it represents life unpredictability rather than its uh, meaninglessness or cruelty. Uh, it is quite a humane presentation of death, although it also contains an element of the uncanny. Magnus Enkel's uh, boy with skull is an image that approaches the question of life and death uh, as a mystery. The young boy is shown alone uh, in an indefinable, empty space, staring intently into a skull. Kind of like a modern Hamlet, he appears to be addressing the skull with the ultimate question of whether existence has any purpose or meaning at all. Um, this particular work is part of a series of images of young boys that Enkel made in the early 1890s. And the most uh, uh, famous work in this series is the painting called The Awakening. It is an image of a young boy sitting on the edge of what, what appears to be an unmade bed. And this painting is different from the rest of the series because the other boys are still kind of safely in the realm of childhood, but this one is somewhat older and he's already at the threshold of childhood and adulthood between innocence and experience. Uh, and the boy's age connects this painting with the fashion fashionable theme of puberty, uh, which has been most famously expressed in Edvard Munch's painting, which has a very similar composition. Um, in Enkel's painting, the background is divided into dark and light areas, and the boy is kind of positioned between these two fields, his foot still touching the darkness, darkness but the rest of his body already uh, in the light. And if we describe it in this way, uh, appears as an image of some kind of spiritual awakening. Um, but, uh, however, if we examine its theme in the light of late 19th century discourses, the onset of puberty also suggests a kind of forgetting. Uh, as a rite of passage, puberty can, can be seen as a kind of symbolical death. Uh, childhood was understood as an era of innocence and purity, uh, which was often associated with, an, with a kind of intuitive connection with the cosmos. Uh, Schopenhauer, for example, whose uh, uh, pessimistic theories were popular among artists, described childhood as a paradisiac state of happiness, the lost Eden to which we yearn to return for the rest of our lives. Simberg's painting Fairy Tale can also be read as an image of the loss of innocence. Uh, it, uh, it shows a young girl who is wearing a white dress suggesting purity, and, uh, and the girl is riding through a fairy tale forest on the back of a fantastic animal that kind of resembles a bear but doesn't look like any bear that you would encounter in real life. Uh, the girl has perhaps embarked on a symbolic journey towards the unknown. The animal may be seen as a symbol of, of the unconscious drives that have taken control, and the dark water in the foreground suggests the unknown realm that lies ahead of her. Many examples of women and animals uh, often with uh, quite uh, clearly sexual undertones, can be found in the art of the period. Um, in in Simberg's ima image, however, the suge suggestions of sexuality are quite subtle, if there are any. Um, Arnold Böcklin's painting, The Silence of the Forest, was probably among the works that gave uh, inspiration to Simberg. Both artists present an image of a young girl riding through the forest on the back of a mythical animal, which in Berklin's case is a somewhat grotesque uh, unicorn. 
the opposition between the, the kind of the pure young girl and the beast that carries her is clear, but the animal is not in any way fear-provoking, and the and the girl uh, does not appear to be frightened of it. In Simberg's painting, the girl seems to be listening intently to the whisperings of the forest in the background, perhaps a uh, reference to Baudelaire's poem uh, Correspondance, in which uh, nature is described as a temple with trees, its living columns that whisper uh, obscure words. Uh, in Simberg's uh, image, the fairy tale world of, of art does not appear to be opposed to the realm of, of unconscious drives like sexuality. So perhaps the girl's journey is also that of the artist who kind of lets unconscious impulses lead him into the world of, of art. Uh, the painting Fantasy by the same artist uh, portrays a figure similar to the girl in the first version of the fairy tale, but uh, as a slightly older woman. The palette echoes the same deep shades of red and green, uh, and the figure's eyes are again closed, and she appears to be uh, in a state of deep concentration. But instead of wearing white, the symbol of innocence, the, wom the woman is here dressed in black, uh, exuding mysticism and uh, esoteric knowledge. And her eyelids are kind of glowing, uh, as if signifying some kind of inner enlightenment. A vision materializes in front of her, uh, a golden hand that is clutching a diamond or a crystal, uh, both of which can be seen as symbols of spirituality and higher consciousness. Stimberg's paintings uh, wave, uh, weave together fantasy and reality, uh, instilling the ordinary with an aura of mystery, uh, evoking uh, different moods that swing from exuberance to grief and melancholy. Uh, and he shows this uh, character gallery that is a cavalcade of human uh, human figures that consort with skeletons, angels and devils, uh, all portrayed as individualized, contemplative beings, uh, imbued with depths of emotional uh, complex complexity. Uh, in this world of myth and fairy tale, Simberg discovered a vehicle for expressing, expressing ineffable and disquieting ideas. Uh, some of which were difficult for even the artist himself to, to fully fathom. The psychological tension of these fantasy paintings uh, derives from the hidden symbolism, kind of seething beneath their surface. Uh, the uh, outwardly simple, occasionally even childlike paintings uh, belie a complex multitude of o overlapping meanings. Among his uh, key works are also these uh, personifications of the seasons and, and of forces of nature, uh, many of which he executed in several variations. Uh, here you can see the first and the second version of the painting Autumn. Uh, the first version portrays a skeletal figure sinking its teeth into a, a, a very slender tree trunk, uh, and the legs of the figure are, are kind of sprouting from the ground like the roots of the tree that, that it is uh, biting with its teeth. Uh, uh, then in the following variant, uh, the figure of Autumn is uh, curled up in a kind of fetal position, its eyes tightly shut, uh, as the first snow, snowflakes of winter fall in the foreground. Again, the figure's feet are deeply rooted uh, in the ground. Uh, in this case, it seems like Autumn has finished his work and has curled up to rest uh, 
but not to die. Uh, life and death are not shown here as opposites, but rather as symbolically intertwined. Uh, these images are highly original and inventive in their content and execution, but they also owe an obvious debt to symbolist art, uh, as is signaled uh, by the simplified treatment of form and, uh, and the intense palette, uh, and the absence of, realistic, of a realistic illusion of death. Um, also, the reference to the cycles of seasons uh, echoes the spiritual aspirations of the symbolists who regarded human life uh, as part of a great cosmic cycle. The artist Beda Shanskans also reflected on this idea in her artistic production. Uh, the painting known as Pastoral or Primavera uh, represents a landscape of eternal spring where primroses are forever blooming, the trees are just bursting into leaf and the river of time stands still. It is clearly an image of purity harmony and timelessness, uh, an existence that is completely untouched by modernity. Uh, its pale hues and the fresco-like quality, as well as the references to classical mytholo mythology, bring to mind the work of uh, Pierre Puvis de Chavon. Um, his art is uh, idealistic and allegorical and essentially visual. Instead of narration or psychology, it employs gestures, postures and situations. Uh, the simplified forms, uh, lack of illusionistic depth and muted colors create a sense of immateriality and the overall effect is silent, silent and calm harmonious and often uh, a little bit melancholic. And these el essential elements of the art of Puvis can also be found in pastoral. Um, the fresco aesthetic uh, also reflects this repugnancy towards oil painting, which arose during the 19th century uh, as uh, avant-garde artists started to rebel against the academic tradition. Oil, pan oil painting came to be associated with illusion, uh, imitation, and uh, prosaic facts. So artists therefore sought different techniques, uh, such as watercolors, watercolors or tempera, which were considered more spontaneous and more archaic, and therefore more kind of directly expressive. And even those who uh, continued to work with oils, uh, like uh, Beda Shanskans, for example, uh, made an effort to distance themselves from the detailed and illusionistic aesthetics favored by the academic tradition. Um, the simplified visual language that echoes the uh, spiritualized forms and colors of, of early Renaissance art was intended to produce an effect of immateriality and universal significance. The beautiful young people who inhabit this uh, idyllic landscape in Shanskansi's pastoral have all kind of sunken into a state of, of blissful reverie. Um, a girl dressed in white in the foreground is gathering spring flowers into her lap, and a young boy uh, behind her is playing the flute. And further away, you can see another young boy staring into the stagnant water of the river, whilst the girl is placing a wreath of flowers uh, on his head. So the, uh, the painting overall represents an image of a paradisiac existence where time stands still. In the context of uh, the fin de siècle, this kind of nostalgia for timelessness appeared as a counterforce to the urban and industrialized modern world, which seemed to be in a, in a constant state of change. Uh, the references to classical 
uh, myths evoke associations of the lost golden age uh, of beauty and harmony. A famous fin de siècle inter interpretation of the myth of the golden age um, was given by uh, André Gide in his uh, Le Traité du Narcisse. So the boy in, uh, in Shanskansi's painting, uh, sitting by the river, could be seen as Narcissus, perhaps uh, specifically the one that we encounter in Le Traité du Narcisse. That is, Narcissus uh, relocated in the Garden of Eden, uh, where the beautiful forms blossom only once because everything is already perfect and nothing needs to change. Or he could also be interpreted as Alphonse, the beautiful youth who was loved by Emperor Hadrian. In the poem by the Swedish author Victor Rudberg, which uh, Shanskans had actually a few years earlier copied uh, into her notebook, Antinous is pictured in eternal springtime on a blossoming shore with a lotus wreath on his head. Uh, both uh, Gide's Narcissus and, and Rydberg's Antinous are mytholo mythological figures living in a timeless existence, aware of the illusory nature of things that come and go. So, in a way, this uh, Narcissus Antinous is then a perfect illustration of the whole mission of uh, symbolist art, which sought to separate truth from appearance. The paradisiac state of being, where there is no past and no future, is the only thing that truly exists. Uh, and the human world of birth and death and endless change is only an illusion. Um, another Finnish uh, fin de siècle uh, rendering of the theme of the Golden Age was produced by Magnus Enkel. And the two artists were actually close friends. Uh, and here again, we encounter the fresco-like muted colors and the sense of timelessness, um, which the late 19th century uh, artists assumed from the works of, uh, of Puvis de Chavannes, as well as directly from the early uh, Italian Renaissance frescoes, uh, which had also been inspira an inspiration for Puvis. Uh, in 1898, Enkel had made a copy of uh, Masaccio's uh, famous fre fresco depicting uh, expulsion from paradise. Uh, and if you look at the painting, The Golden Age, you can see that it kind of seems to embody the moment just before the one represented by Masaccio. Uh, Adam and Eve still reside in the state of divine happiness without any knowledge of suffering or death. So like Beda Shanskans, Magnus Enkel was an artist who was very much uh, inspired by classical uh, myths and particularly by, by their fin de siècle interpretations. Uh, the painting Fantasy which you see here in two different versions, both from 1895, uh, is an interesting example. Uh, Ovid's metamorphosis can be identified uh, as a kind of a common source for Enkel's uh, mythological imagery. But instead of referring to just one Ovidian uh, motive, the paintings can be seen to combine elements from different stories. So it's a kind of similar uh, paraphrastic logic that we saw at work in Shanskansi's paintings. Uh, in both versions of fantasy, a young man with a wreath of uh, red roses on his head is seated by a pond with black and white swans. Uh, the man is surrounded by the black swans, while the white ones are further up above his head, uh, out of reach. Uh, 
Uh, in one of the versions, you can see the young man holding a lyre, the instrument associated with both Apollo and Orpheus. Uh, the young man can be interpreted as a representation of the artist's melancholic self, perhaps. Um, and the painting can therefore be associated with the ancient duality of the Apollonian and Dionysian forces that had been popularized by Nietzsche in the birth of tragedy. Uh, and these Nietzschean elements are here combined with echoes of, of both Parisian mysticism and of the influential, influential art of Berlin. So the black swans then appear as symbols of the Dionysian pain that's, that lies at the heart of all creative work, while the white swans represents the eter eternal ideal of beauty and the secrets of life and death. Uh, both versions kind of represent a dynamis dynamism between light and darkness, uh, which was also something that uh, Enkel pondered on in his notebooks from the period. Um, interestingly, interestingly, there is a remarkable difference between the two versions of fantasy. Uh, in one version, the man is completely in the dark area, his head bent down and his eyes uh, appear to be tightly shut. Whilst uh, in the, the other version, the, the one in which the man is holding the, uh, the leer, he has straightened his back and the white swans are now above his head like a shining halo. So th this uh, more enlightened looking uh, boy uh, with the leer is kind of can be seen to be in the realm of Apollo, uh, his head surrounded by the white birds, whereas in the second version the figure appears to be more distorted uh, and to reside in the realm of darkness, the underworld of, of unconscious drives, which uh, uh, poses a threat to our individuality, uh, but there is a at the same time, uh, something seductive, something that lures us to throw ourselves into the Dionysian experience. Um, the motive of the swan, uh, which was almost banal in its popularity in the art of the period, uh, also appears in the work of uh, the artist Akseli Gallen Kallela. Um, and this will be uh, the final example of a painting that I, I will discuss at length today. Um, but uh, tomorrow, uh, Rita Ojampera from the Finnish National Gallery will give another talk on, on Gallen Kallela, which I, I can highly recommend. Um, he's kind of a national hero uh, as an artist, uh, someone who is considered very important for the uh, Finnish national identity, but uh, what I'm trying to say is that, that um, he was also a very international artist and his, his works are, are deeply interconnected with, um, with the artistic uh, currents of the period and he was always looking for an international breakthrough which didn't quite happen during his lifetime. Um, the painting that I've chosen as an example here is, uh, is incredibly rich in its uh, sort of cultural uh, intertextual references. Uh, and it is Lemminkainen's mother. Lemminkainen uh, is a hero from the uh, so-called national epic, the Kalevala. Uh, and in the Kalevala, the swan is a holy bird and it lives in the river that borders the underworld realm of death, known as Tuonela. Uh, in Gallen Kallela's painting, the swan often appears, and it is a very multifaceted symbol, reflecting the ideal of art, the mystery of life and death, uh, as well as uh, it also has connections to, to sexuality. Uh, the painting 
uh, depicts Lemminkainen's mother lamenting over her son's dead body. Um, according to the legend described in the Kalevala, Lemminkainen attempts to hunt the holy bird and is killed and dismembered in this process. So his mother gathers the pieces of her son's body from the dark water and brings him back to life. Uh, the swan is seen in the background gliding in the pitch black water of the river, uh, gazing di directly at the viewer. Uh, it has escaped completely unharmed from Lemminkainen's effort to catch it. Uh, whereas the brave hero is now shown at the mercy of his mother's love. Uh, the swan thus uh, becomes a symbol of something that is uh, impossible to attain. And as the bird who reigns in the river that separates this world from the realm of, uh, of death, uh, it is, of course, in possession of the secrets of life and death. Uh, and this uh, mythical element reflects a more sort of universal symbolism of the swan. Uh, Gallen Kallela's van der Siegler interpretation uh, of this theme adds uh, yet another level of, of mythical syncretism. Uh, the theme of uh, resurrection and the Pietà-like composition uh, also connect Lemminkainen with Christ. Uh, and the descent to the realm of death and the dismemberment of the hero uh, link him with the mythical figure of Orpheus. Uh, but then we also have this like uh, a national theme uh, emerging from from the Kalevala. Uh, and Gallen Kalevala was among the Finnish artists who traveled to the eastern province of Karelia, uh, where it, it was believed that the, the last surviving members of the original Kalevalian tribes uh, were still existing. Uh, the Kalevala, as a, a work of literature, uh, was a 19th century construction. Uh, put together by Elias Lönnrot and uh, first published in the 1830s, but it was based on oral traditions, uh, which were believed at least to be of very ancient origin. Uh, as for his deeper motives, uh, Galen Kallela's deeper motives, the Karelian ex expedition was uh, can be seen to, to have been spurred by the same uh, thirst for exotism exotism and cultural authenticity that later uh, in his life uh, uh, drove him to uh, very remote outposts uh, and indigenous villages of, of uh, both Africa and uh, North America. Uh, for him, the world of Finnish folklore represented kind of an opposite of modern Parisian decadence. Um, but of course, this uh, personal mission to reconnect with, with his Finnish uh, heritage also reflects a more broad, uh, broader international trend. Uh, the rapid industrialization, urbanization, and modernization of Western society during the 19th century uh, witnessed a newfound interest in the simple authenticity of, of ethnic cultures. Because in Germany, the emergence of the concept of uh, the concept of folk coincided with the rising tide of nationalist sentiment. Uh, although folk could also be understood in in more abstract terms, uh, the ideal being the peasant farmer with an unbroken connection to the soil beneath his feet. And art too began to evince this hunger for uh, local or national root. Um, as was mentioned earlier in France, many artists abandoned the hectic pace of Paris to paint in the countryside, countryside especially Brittany. Uh, 
Gallen Kallela's enthusiasm for the Kalevala and Karelian culture can uh, thus be seen as part of a, a Europe-wide uh, quest for origins that was common, common among his contemporaries. Uh, from a Finnish perspective, the Karelianist movement has tended to be viewed as an inherently national quest, but uh, as you can see, the background story is far more complex, as is also evinced by the fact that Kallen Kallela's search for origins then later took him uh, to Africa and North America. And he even said that he hoped uh, to discover the original Kalevalian people in Africa. Uh, also, quite tellingly, uh, after his first uh, trip to the Russian side of Karelia, um, he never returned. So his initial uh, impressions offered enough inspiration for a lifetime. Uh, over the years, however, his uh, fictive uh, Kalevalian world drifted further and further away from the, uh, from the reality as he kind of gradually uh, refined his vision to match his ideals. Um, based on inspiration originally drawn from Karelia, uh, Gallen Kalela gradually developed a visual rendition of the Kalevala that has become so deeply etched uh, in the popular imagination as to be deemed the one true image of authentic Kalevalian reality. Uh, this idea has become firmly entrenched in, in Finnish culture, even though Kallen Kallala soon abandoned na naturalism of his early Kalevalian motives, uh, as seen here in the uh, Aino triptych, uh, which was one of his uh, first uh, Kalevala images. Uh, but he later came to favor uh, kind of a growing degree of stylization, influenced uh, clearly by uh, international symbolism, uh, which accentuated not the national but the universal aspects, aspects of the Kalevalian myth. Uh, so his art began to fuse the Kalevalian world with uh, uh, esotericism and uh, syncretistic uh, ideas of, of the, like the connection between uh, different religions. So Lemminkainen's mother combi combines a Kalevalian theme with the Christian Pieta motive uh, depicting the Virgin Mary cradling the dead body of, of Jesus. Uh, the artist's own mother actually posed for this painting, which kind of adds an intimate touch uh, to it. Uh, by the time Gallen Kallela painted this work, he had come to a point in his life where he uh, regarded art as his sublime mission and nature as the temple of art. And the Kalevala uh, was to him a sacred book containing hidden knowledge and mysteries. So, um, to conclude, um, what I have demonstrated here is um, that there was a great variety in the fascination with folk traditions and myths uh, found in, in Finnish art around the year 1900. Uh, myth and magic represented something that was opposed to the decadence of modern world. Stories about the mythical origins of people, folk legends, indigenous traditions of poetry and music, ancient customs and beliefs. This kind of material was valued by artists who were in search of a new language of art that would constitute a break with the established tradition, but at the si same time would be deeply rooted in more ancient and original practices. Of course, we know that in the 20th century, the study of hidden symbolism in myths and fairy tales became a central concern for the psychoanalytic theory. Uh, but the connection between fairy tales and the, the unconscious had already been understood by the romantics, and this idea was also central to, to these uh, late 19th century artists. 
uh, the mythical content of uh, folk legends, poems and fairy tales had the ability to stimulate artistic imagination. And in this sense, the popularity of myths and fairy tales among artists of the period is a reflection of the new subjective, uh, more imaginative approach uh, to art. Fairy tale images are overtly anti-naturalist and they make it unquestionably clear and that the artwork is not meant to be a realistic representation of the world as it appears to the senses. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Any questions from the audience? No, no questions from the audience? Okay. Now we're going to go on to the next uh, conference on Munch. There'll be two speakers. And here we'll be trying to see how a modern artist can make his work live even after his death. Otherwise, I wish you a good day. Please help yourself with uh, the programs. Uh, the smaller ones are the ones that have been updated. Thank you very much.